So my name is Kathleen Hara, and I am a resident artist at Conservatory Lab Charter School, a school in Boston. I am Brad Barrett. I teach at the same school. And we are going to just do a, a presentation on the concept of artistic citizenship. So when we say artistic citizenship, we're viewing <clears throat> artists as ideal members of a participatory democracy, essentially. So the things that artists do are the things that we are wanting citizens to be doing, to be thinking critically about the world around them, reflecting on that, and then channeling that into action in some form or fashion. So essentially the problem that we're laying out in our thesis is, as policymakers and educators routinely note, Community participation, critical thinking, and creative problem solving are not effectively cultivated in the current U.S. education system. And I do want to point out before we move on that any of the artwork you see on the slides is student artwork related to a lot of the projects that we're going to be talking to you about. Intellectual processes supported by the arts can be a potential solution to this problem. Through the arts, Students in high quality programs learn to develop and discern their ideas and connect their perspectives to broader civic discourses. However, traditional approaches to music education, those that emphasize technique at the expense of creative thinking, will not necessarily meet this goal. Students in community-based arts programs must be taught to use the arts as a means to craft new and diverse perspectives across the lines of historical and socioeconomic difference. We argue that the skills and experiences engendered through community-based music education and taught by teaching artists active in their fields are increasingly relevant to supporting the civic voice and actions needed to productively participate in modern political discourse. So, artistic citizenship, and we just want to make sure this is based in literature. This is a concept that is not new, but we are seeing it in a different way. Um, artistic citizenship is defined by Elliot Silverman and Bowman as individuals who are committed to engaging in artistic actions in ways that can bring people together, enhance communal well-being, and contribute substantially to human thriving. Artistic citizens engage in a style of praxis that consists of thoughtful and careful pra artistic practice of artistic action that is embedded in and responsive to ever-changing social, cultural, and political circumstances. Through their commentary, artistic citizens shoulder a social and ethical responsibility to reflect their critical perspective on society and their relationship to it, to shed light and raise questions about injustice, inequity, and the viewpoints of marginalized groups. And so clearly this isn't like a new perspective on art making. Um, if you look back at the 20th century, there's tons of artists that do engage in this through their art making process, um, like Mingus, and Charles Mingus, uh, Nina Simone, uh, Bob Dylan, um, Kendrick Lamar today. So why artistic citizenship? Communication through art making facilitates understandings about society and enables individuals to insert their perspectives, their civic voices into the public sphere. So we really are looking at this as a focus on how our students, how young people, can feel that they have a civic voice, that they're participating in the society around them. Students in high quality arts education programming learn to engage in this type of dialogue through their craft and in turn, the process of arts education teaches students to notice critically and reflectively what's in the world and what could be and make this visible through art making. We want them to start pushing the concept of imagination and the metacognitive skills that they need in order to create that feeling and make it normal. The release of imagination through the creati creative process serves a civic purpose. Imagining things being otherwise may be a first step toward acting on the belief that they can be changed. You just start by itself. So actually pause for one second, please. Before we start this video, a lot of our projects that we do at our school relate to, if we can possibly do it, we relate them to social happenings around our students, often places where they have not been able to share a voice, and we feel like they're able to share something really important. It's a relevant moment for them, and they can talk about it through their arts. 
So when the shooting happened in Florida, this was, it was a moment that really affected our students and our staff, obviously. And we wanted them to have a really powerful way to speak about it that was unique to them, that was authentic. Um, and so each one of our groups composed a piece for each victim of the Parkland shooting and then presented it in a collection of videos. But this is all 100% student work. They created the music that goes behind it. They wrote the words that go with it. They were thinking through the processes, like why this happened, what could have been done. They were reflecting on it in their own way. So just a little about us. Um, we're in Dorchester. The, it's part of Boston. Um, the oldest neighborhood in Boston. We have really. both been at the school for nearly 10 years now. Um, and as time has unfolded, we have gradually shifted our focus towards much more creative practice, especially the past three years or so. Right. I mean, some of the examples you're going to see are the beginning of what really pushed us into focusing on the creative side of teaching. Um, it's been a really amazing experience to work in a school where we have time and we have the uh, staff. We have more than one music teacher, obviously, so we have a lot of space to do the work that we want to do, but we are also like encouraged and given the space to be creative on our own as teachers. Yeah, and we have the luxury of seeing our students every day, which is huge. Um, so just quickly, you can all read this, but I think the main focus is that we really have seen how important it is for our students to learn the process, to think more about process, to see that failure is okay, fail, learn from it, and move, like keep going, find out what it is that you actually want from your process to happen. Um, it has changed the way that we teach a lot, just to think more around that concept instead of thinking of an outcome. This is another piece. This is kind of the beginning of when we started changing our practices. And it is related to a situation our school was going through and is still going through. Our students um, experienced a school expansion, which many places go through, and it was really difficult for them. It very much affected them. They are still in a space that's really not conducive to you know, optimal learning for children. Um, they're still waiting on a permanent school space. And there was a lot of frustration around that. The kids had to deal with it, they weren't given a lot of options, they lost a lot of their friends who moved to other schools, they lost a lot of teachers because we had a lot of turnover, and the frustration and sadness and confusion that was there was never really addressed with our students. And we, we felt that there had to be some way that they could talk about this through their arts in a way that was positive and allowed them to feel like they were heard by the adults that were around them and that were making these decisions for them. So this is the first movement of a suite that our students combined, uh, created. And it's like from third through eighth graders, the groups of students that we're working with, all grades participated in some portion of this. But this is just the end result, so you don't obviously see all the grades. This has an interdisciplinary <coughs> nature to it as well. So the students are composing text. There's a lot of visual art as well.
You can stop it there. So just to put some context on that, the entire piece was written by students, the musical component and the spoken word. Um, it's completely conducted by students as well, which is a big step that we've taken in this process. Uh, we try to have all of our ensembles be conductorless ensembles so that a lot of the emphasis is put on our students to be their own leaders, to be the ones in charge of the process. Um, and then this is an example of some of the compositions that they made for that piece. You can see that it's not a traditional score in any way. <laughs> <laughs> right. So before we move on, it's, we're about to take a turn and things are going to get a lot more out. Um, <laughs> are there any questions about w where we are at this point? So there is a question. Good morning. Um, I'm a former clarinet player who's now um, a grad student at Harvard who thinks a lot about arts education. And so I noted that you cited a lot of the folks in the beginning as people who embodied artistic citizenship, including Nina Simone, Bob Dylan, and Kendrick Lamar as folks who embodied artistic citizenship. And none of these people are especially known for creating classical music. I guess Nina Simone is an exception to that in a way, but that's not what she's especially known for. Um, and so I wonder, um, as someone who has studied classical music and jazz and hip hop and a lot of different things, I wonder personally if um, classical music genuinely lends itself to decolonized and um, decolonial notions of developing artistic citizenship, or um, do you kind of view it as that, or do you kind of view it as something that creates a fundamental structure for in introducing students to composition into musical concepts? Because I just wonder if like, this is really a means for us to embody a lot of the principles which we seek since it was created in um, institutions which embody white supremacy and like really don't consider um, marginalized voices? I think it's a really good question. Um, I also think it's, it's what we're in right now. Mm -hmm. So we're an El Sistema infused program. So that's mm -hmm. kind of where we started from. And I think like the roots of El Sistema are partially speaking to that where it's, it's turning it on its head. Like we're using it in a different way. But I also think that we're using whatever we can get as a way for our students to get an arts education and in, in this high quality way as possible so that their voices are clear, they're able to be heard as they want to be heard. So, you know, it's a concept that's difficult, right? But I also feel like my students are taking charge of it. Yeah. Like that's the point, right? And yeah. they're the ones taking control of what the future of it is. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to present this year was because of what Afa said last year about what do we have to do so that an organization like Sphinx doesn't have to exist. Yeah. And frankly, for that to happen, where do we need to work? Like, it's not necessarily a conservatory we need to be working at. It's not the highest levels of traditional classical orchestra. We need to think about the artist as a practitioner, as a person who's speaking on society. We need to look at our youngest people in this society and how do we affect them most most clearly, most directly, and give them the kind of voice that they're going to need if they want to be able to change what's coming, right? Mm -hmm. For us, as an artist, that, that's, that's the power that they have, right? If they're doing it on a violin, if they're using an instrument that has a negative connotation in, in, past, in past hands, that's not them they're able to do what they want to do with it. I think like what we're trying to do too is step away from the structure of a classical music education, right? Mm -hmm. It isn't just that. It's about asking yourself, where is your voice? Like, what are you trying to say through your art? So does that answer kind of? Mas o menos. Mas o menos, un poquito. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, do you want to take it? So we have a question on here. Do you ever think that part of the problem with people embracing artistic leadership is because the language of cultural poli policy is exclusive? I'm not sure how to answer that. Not, yeah. I'm not sure if that's the right <laughs> Maybe? <laughs> um, 
the language of culture or policy is not clear. <laughs> and I don't think it's an, a problem of people embracing artistic leadership. I think that there's a lack of clear artistic leadership in our society. I think, again, it, it makes a difference to start with youth, to start with younger ages when you're talking about people leading. Um, and I feel like there aren't enough people in positions of power focusing on this, embracing this, and to even talk about them being embraced by policy. Sorry for a, a <laughs> vague answer. <laughs> um, I guess at the core of what we do, it's about getting the students to make, like be masters of their own destiny as composers, as musicians, as artists, creators. and uh, as creators. And as, as we continue here, I think that this is a, a, like, a, like a jumping off point. So um, last year we did a unit with our students about Fluxus. So if you don't know what Fluxus is, it's a style of experimental art that arose from the philosophy and teachings of John Cage in the late 50s. And the movement sought to expand the conception of what art and music could be. Fluxus compositions focus on creating events and experiential art experiences through text-based instruction scores. So when we did this last year, we went through, we, we performed four minutes and 33 seconds. We watched performances of it. We talked a lot about what visualizing some sort of artistic experience means and how to articulate that using text instead of music. Um, so it's, you don't need a whole lot of music literacy to engage in this, but I feel like it's an extremely valuable um, activity for the students to engage in. So we ended up with just a plethora of widely diverse student works, um, and we can, we'll show you one well, here in just a moment. And I think this is also a really cool point to look at. Like, this was important for our students to see because it was completely separate from their classical music tradition that they're studying, right? They were suddenly creating things in a totally new way. And it was an amazing like change in them when we saw them doing this process. This, it was like a metamorphosis into the creators that they could be. So this is um, a piece that was composed by one of the little boys in fifth grade, I think. No, sixth, sixth no, grade. No, this is Jasmine's sixth, piece. Jas Jasmine. This is Jasmine's so piece. So this is a visual, um, <laughs> a visual score, and you will see how she uses it. And sorry, just sorry. just because I'm sure you guys will ask, um, the masks are because right. we did also did a unit on Afrofuturism, so we studied Sun Ra and um, yeah. talked about different <laughs> you know different ways to view ourselves through performance. Right. So we made masks to go along with our Fluxus compositions.
<laughs> so to get pieces like this, um, we had maybe around 20 different prompts that we gave students. Um, so whatever resonated with them, whatever direction that they wanted to go. Um, so these are just a few. I won't read them. You can read them yourself. Um, but I mean, these are based on real Fluxus pieces. I right. basically just sort of try to distill them into one or two sentences and then turn it into a prompt for the students to interpret. There is a Fluxus workbook that is free online and it is really fascinating, the ideas that come out of it. Um, and this is after we had already shown our students, like this is an example of these written directions being acted out. So they'd already had a visual and they already had audio of it. And this is an example of one of our students. This is what he came up with and we also performed this. If you can, can you all read it? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Obviously, we're going to Colin Kaepernick. It says, play, play the national anthem on one knee, period. At some point, lay down on your back. And it's named the Brian Anthem by Brian Rodriguez. <laughs> so these are just examples of the types of compositions, the types of work that we've done with our students. Um, most are pretty straightforward. The harmelotics one is a concept that we came up that's, I mean, related to Ornette. It, it comes out of Ornette Coleman's yeah. music, so um, I, I'm much more of a jazz player, but um, in, in Ornette Coleman's music, it's uh, often written and interpreted without a clef. So it's f all, all musicians would just read at whatever pitch they, that they would naturally read at. So we read compos student compositions this way very frequently. So it's, if you are the, on the middle line of the staff, the basses would play a D, the violas would play a C, and then the violins would play a B, and then there's this natural like motion of things together that ends up sounding super cool. It's a really crunchy sort of intonate. It's, it's wonderful. We'll it play one great. for you in just yeah. a moment, too. Yeah. And we also play it for our students sometimes before they try and play it, just so they have a better concept of it, of what it's going to sound like. Um, and as we do these things, since they are all new right. compositions, there's no conventions of performance. Right. We are free to decide together what the dynamic should be, what the tempo should be. The students get to be completely in control of the way the music sounds. And one of the major things we do before we even perform any of this is sit with the students as part of the ensemble and ask them to critique and ask them to talk about it, which is another really powerful part of this change in their process. So also just a really quick comment on that particular piece, and this is something we've seen throughout the teaching. It was created by a little boy that we've known since he was very small, and honestly has never really been excited about playing classical music, about playing his instrument. He struggles physically, he's got some things going on, and this came out of him, like almost without any direction from us. Like he had the idea of it, and he just, ran. He started writing notes down. He started seeing motives, even without necessarily us pointing it out. 
And it, it's not the first time that we've seen a lot of students who are in our programs, our programming is required. Every student has to take an instrument in our school. Every student has to take these classes every day. So we were seeing kids who had traditionally really not been super excited about what was going on. Suddenly they had found this way of being a creator and being a participant. And it was totally new for him. It was like a super high jolt of self-esteem. So that's another side effect of this that I think is incredibly important when we're talking about helping students grow into these very civic-minded people, people who can create their own ideas, who have a thought process behind that. Um, this is an example of one of the compositions, and it just has a quote on it that is from one of our students. When, um, when Brad was asking all of them how they felt about this, how they reacted to the process. Um, it's someone's creativity that matters. Even though the other pieces we played before were someone's creativity, this is kids create, creating creativity, and I really want to dig into that imagination that kids have. This is from a fifth grader. So again, these are also examples of some of the um, compositions that came out of this process. The one on the right is more of a motivic composition. The one on the left, he put notes, we drew lines on the score, and then he put notes on his lines. Once he had that, he realized it looked, when he heard it, he realized it sounded like bouncing, so he decided it should be named Brian Bunny Rabbit. And a after we compose these, then frequently we decorate the scores right. too. We don't read them looking like this, but it just adds an extra <laughs> wrinkle into it for ourselves. But we do hang it up <laughs> often for the kids to see it like this. And these and are some more of the graphic, graphic scores. scores. So uh, this has creatures and little earth kind of exploding into flowers and butterflies. I mean, we do ask the kids to interpret this with their instruments. So like, how do you, how do you create that creature's sound? What is this motion of it climbing through the staff sound like? And sometimes the pictures themselves lend, they end up being reinterpreted as like real notes and stuff. Right. So sometimes this is provides like a launching off point for a more traditional composition. Um, we also work with uh, classroom teachers. So um, this year we've been trying to set a little bit more of their poetry. So these are two fifth graders. Um, the kid who's speaking um, wrote the poem and the bassist wrote the music and then together we assembled it into a short piece. <laughs> the first time he performed it, he had ears on that he'd worn to school for some reason, mm. so it was really cute then. <laughs> Sorry it's so quiet. <laughs> um, Do you want to? should probably, I, I think, think yeah, yeah. We're almost there. Yeah. So, <laughs> creative interdisciplinary arts programs can develop active citizens. The background is also another example of one of the scores that they created. An artist observes the world and interacts with it through their art. They can make thoughtful political statement using tools that communicate to broad and diverse audiences. Age does not limit this interaction. So, 
So our primary conclusions are just really it's the inclusion of creative practice is so key. Um, the development of personal identity and the connection to the community. Um, in general, just less replication of tr tradition and more enabling of students to explore and augment traditions through their own artistic lens. Music educators should be teaching students to use the arts to inject their perspectives into the public sphere and steer cultural and political discourse. Any questions? Hi, my name is Eric Williamson. I am a conductor and music educator in Brooklyn, New York, and a master's student at Teachers College, Columbia University. So I just appreciate <laughs> all of the open-endedness um, of the curriculum that you're putting together and the lessons and the projects. Um, but I do have a question regarding timeline, because I teach predominantly fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, um, and I only see my kids for 45 minutes uh, once a week. So if you can speak to the process of creating these projects in terms of you know how long you spend in the brainstorming process, how long are they given a prompt for creating the assignment and then the performance aspect, and also in terms of the project, are there objectives or benchmarks in terms of um, what they are expected to get um, out of each project? Um, just thinking about assessment and um, ways I can pitch this to administration that I can be justified in doing of these course. projects. <laughs> this is always the question <laughs> when you have 45 minutes once a week <laughs> and, and you have to meet goals. Yeah, as we've said, I mean, our program is very open. We're very free as educators, and I think that is in and of itself something to talk about. But this has to be something that works for you. So it is about you seeing yourself as that creator as well. And how does it fit into what your normal timeline is, right? Um, the outcomes that we're going to get are not the same thing that someone who has 45 minutes once a week are, this, are going to get, right? Um, the timeline's not going to be the same. But the achievement at the end is this personal voice, is this process of creation. Um, we still look it's, for like it's, technical it's things. It's very hard to right? plan like an uh, ultimate end result with these things because so often the students give you something that you didn't expect that's right. really great and then you want to go in that direction. So um, I feel like often like I, I'll have like our class, class periods are 45 minutes as well. So like mm -hmm. I would dedicate an day. entire class period towards like a general like everyone is composing something. I would probably give some sort of specific prompt or some sort of framework so it's not just like a free writing situation. Um, but like that poem, that was, I did that in one class period um, with, the, the poem already existed and then the bassist had made the music in my class in one of those 45 minute class right. periods. So then one more additional one, we sat together and then we worked it out and then they have to rehearse it of course too. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's hard for us to give you, you know, it would take this amount of time, X, yeah. Y, and Z. It depends on the scope, That's too. Like it would, it would if, take this amount yeah. of time for like the projects we're doing. However, you can develop something else that is, like I have a 45 minute period here with 40 students, right? Our, our classes are not always like that either. We have some really gigantic classes, mm -hmm. but some of them are quite small. So we can sit with them for a 45 minute period and say, I'm going to have you finish composing a one measure piece, right? So that's another project we've been doing recently. We give them one measure and they write, maybe at the youngest grades would say, put just quarter notes on it, anywhere you want. Oh. And then, you know, stuff like that, yeah. right? Uh -huh. So these are practices that eventually create, like they generate product that we can go through yeah, as, their, exactly. as their teachers mm -hmm. and then sort of like cherry pick. All right, right, this is the piece, this is the measure, and this measure, and this measure. We're putting these together, and this is going to be a group composition. Right. right, so we're just like generating as much aggregate creativity as yes. possible, and then we're using our perspective as adults and practicing artists to try to help them focus it into something and then guide them through the decision-making process as much as possible. I don't want to be the one that's making all these final decisions, mm -hmm. but I should be the person that's like leading it and framing it for them to make the choice on what it should be. As far as musical requirements, like if you're following through in a program or some type of curriculum, I mean, we have end goals for every year of what the students are supposed to be learning on their instruments technically, right? Yeah. So, you know, that is something that we incorporate into their practice. If we're asking them to play their own piece, we're also still looking for, can you, can you do this scale? Can you, do you understand posture and right. technique? Yeah. Like that's also part of it. There's a obviously. ton of music literacy that Tons. goes goes into this. So like we don't necessarily have to teach a music literacy class if we're teaching a composition class. Right. 
Thank you, and also just uh, want to say thank you for fostering creativity in the classroom, because it's something that's missing in music education. So <laughs> thank you for that. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Candia Shepard. I am with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's Orchids program, another El Sistema inspired music program. So I'm happy to see that the conversation has come into Sphinx. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to touch on two points and for you to talk to the room about, um, I think you just kind of hit it. What have you seen as a result of having this as part of your process mm -hmm. where the students are concerned? And also if you could talk about where, when and how do you start the conversation with the teachers that you onboard? Um, I'm, I also went to Berkeley College of Music, so I know Dorchester and I know what the demographics are. Mm -hmm. But when you onboard teachers, like what does your teaching um, pool look like? How many jazz musicians are there? How many classical musicians right. are there? And then how do you have that conversation to have, um, we're gonna do creative composition or creative music making as part of our curriculum process? Well, we try to lead by example a lot. Right. So we do a lot of co-teaching. So um, the backgrounds of our teachers are mostly classical. Um, I'm a jazz musician and another, another teacher is a jazz musician, but mostly it's classical musicians. Um, but I think it's just doing these things together and modeling the, it, the process. I mean, essentially, a lot of the creative work doesn't look like much. It looks like a bunch of kids like with their instruments by them, like kind of separated apart a noisy classroom and it's very unclear what's going on it to administrator messy. to walk into my yeah. classroom when this is going on right um it's very organized mess i mean the thing is one of the other reasons this has all come about in this school is because our school has had such high teacher turnover rate so this has actually been a way like we've been in this school for quite a long time now and it's been a way for us to sort of develop what was missing because we keep losing teachers right the music program is the only program that hasn't been losing teachers so fast. And I, I, this is not measurable, but I think this is part of it, where we have this freedom to experiment with what we're doing. As far as measurable outcomes, um, I would say beyond like the observational things of seeing certain students that before were not able to really participate, suddenly finding their voice to their instrument, we had an, a huge shift in behavior outcomes, right? So this is so engaging for so many students that it changed the way they were participating in a class, right? It was no longer you're sitting in your seat and we're having like this rehearsal. We, it was always okay, but this, because it is kind of that messy that comes back to like creative group work, I feel like it, it felt better for our students and we saw a change in their participation in class. Yeah, and our on ensembles are, Positively. like we've sort of mentioned as well, are very democratic. So, like, there's a, when we're rehearsing pieces like this, there's a lot of room for everyone to interject what their opinion is. And even if you're not interjecting it, I'm going to ask you. So, like, people are in the ensemble thinking about the art that they're making as they're making it. So That was, like, one of the most uncomfortable things for the students in the beginning, and now is very normal for them, where they, they were not sure, like, how do I respond, right? We're using vocabulary with them that isn't necessarily age appropriate, we're using, we talk to them like musicians, like we treat them like we would treat other ensemble members that we work with. So Right, and we're not standing at the front, right. we're not conducting, we're a member of the ensemble right. that is facilitating discussion and sort of leading, but it's, we do, we're doing this together. And we do require them to speak, like they do have to have an opinion on what they're doing, and that's been really important for them as well. So thank you. I would just want to point out one of our student leaders is here, Asia, and uh, Keith went to another session, but they helped lead uh, part of the conversation because uh, Baltimore Symphony Orchestra Orchids does do a lot of this in our practice as well. And we have gotten to the point where we have our student leaders were able to present on a panel about awesome. this very same topic this Great. week. So I'm glad to see you guys sharing your knowledge with yeah. the rest of the team. Thanks. Thanks. I heard it went very well too. So <laughs> congratulations for that. I'm also from Orchids. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, we do this work all the time, and I love it. Uh, resonates totally with me, and I think creating equity in these spaces. I think it's a huge thing in that way, and leveling the playing field. And like, as adults, like we are no better. You know what I mean? Or I have more maybe knowledge than a student, but that doesn't mean that they don't know more than I. If that makes sense. But my question is this. Um, because I find like people who know and love this work are just like ready to go and talk about it a lot. 
And I wonder how we can change the conversation or just bring this conversation to more spaces of talking about creative work with students because I've found music um, as an art form to be one of those art forms that doesn't always encourage creativity in this way in education. Like I have a literature background and there was never a moment when I was a child where I didn't feel like, oh, your story, you can't write that story, you can't write that poem. Like we were reading works from all kinds of backgrounds, you know, just like um, authors of color, you know, in marginalized populations, but in music it doesn't seem to be happening like that in education. Mm -hmm. How can we change that conversation um, in more places than just here? I think music is the last one of the yeah. art forms yeah. to come around to those things generally for whatever reason. Um, I think it has a, to do with tradition to some extent. Especially instrumental yeah. music. I feel um, like comp a choral composing and vocal composing has a whole other world, right? But I, I'm much more inspired um, by like visual arts pedagogy. I think that when you look at other the way that other art forms are taught and then you look at the way that music is taught, you start to just wonder, like, yeah. is this the right way? Um, so um, I've gone to arts, like visual arts programs and observed and mm -hmm. tried to model my pedagogy off of how they view creativity and the way that they scaffold, mm -hmm. scaffold it. Right. So. I mean, I think a lot of it is asking the people who are turning out music educators, like what do you need to change in your curriculums? I think also talking about students coming out of conservatories that it's not, it, there is no focus as far as I can tell, except in tiny, like small places on developing a person who's going to leave the conservatory and not just preparing to be like on stage to perform, right? right? Like if we're moving into the world to be artists, <laughs> like what does that mean? And redefining that at, at the collegiate level, at the very basic, like the earliest levels, right? I, both of us tell our students all the time, like this is, you're an artist, like this is your voice, this is what you do. So they're growing up thinking about it in a totally different way than someone who maybe started in Suzuki and took that and went into, you know, has a private teacher and whatever. It's a different track. And I think it has to be attacked in the places where we're actually turning out educators and we have to redefine what artists are. Like, are they actually supposed to be educators in our society? Ooh. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're almost out of time. Yeah. Do we have two, two yeah. minutes? One, yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Luisa Maria, and I teach at Laundry School of Music in our Sistema Side by Side program, and I also work in administration. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I was really fortunate because when I was hired, they said, you can teach whatever you want. You're the elective teacher. And what you said, I'm like, okay, I'm not crazy. It's being done. This is awesome. So. Yay. <laughs> but the problem I'm coming into is that my younger kids love it. They are game for anything. And then my kids who are about to get into high school and in high school have said to me, I don't think this is serious music making. Right. This is super important. It's how you set it up. Mm -hmm. Like we show our student, uh, for example, some of the pictures that you saw, like this is one of them. We did a, um, a process on Kahinda Wiley and why he painted what he was painting, right? And then we had a process for them to create binder covers, which is what this is, um, to represent themselves using text that they had to select, just small amounts that they put onto their binder cover and using um, a background. Joseph Albers was the inspiration for mm -hmm. this, right? And representing themselves in a different way. As they get older, I think it's more and more important that they have like relevancy, right? Little kids can understand to a, a, like K1 to third, fourth grade, like they do understand what's going on around them. But especially, we have kids going now into high school, they hear things that are happening around them. They need to be able to intelligently participate in it. The Parkland shooting thing was a huge deal for them because they saw how it affected the adults around them. Mm -hmm. They heard the news, there was a big protest that was gonna happen and they weren't sure like, how do I process this? How do I talk about this, right? I think when you're connecting your projects to things that are really relevant to them, and that means you have to know their environment, you have to know what's important to them and their families, right? Then it gets away from this isn't just like ridiculous, right? Yeah. Yeah, these things build on themselves too. So like our students know at our school now that when we do these composition projects that this music is going to get played. Right. So like if you don't try very hard on your composition, we probably won't do it. But if you take it very seriously, um, then potentially we will or we'll use something. 
Um, and when we rehearse the pieces, it's every bit as serious as anything else. We take it, it's about the way you frame it and to, to the students. So if, if you are uh, taking their piece as seriously as you take Mozart or any other thing that you rehearse, that they will pick up the cues and eventually they'll get on board, I think. <laughs> They do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they get on board every time. Yeah. I mean, it is about like how you present it. All right. I this somebody else asked about like how do you onboard other teachers? It is really difficult to do that unless they have the same sort of like desire for this to happen. They have to observe too. So you have to take it as seriously as I mean. You cannot go in saying this isn't Beethoven. So I'm not. It's not the same. It's fun. No, it's not. It's actually work. Like this is the work we do. This is the technical work that we need to be able to do in order to replicate what this composer wanted us to play. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. I think that's it. Yeah. I so think that's it. Thank yeah. you guys. Thank you for being here.